Tonight's, Tonight's program, Make Thank Our Woods Work, <laughs> is sponsored jointly by the Guilford Conservation Commission, the Guilford Land Conservation Trust, and the Guilford Free Library. At this time, I'd like to welcome Laura Collins, Guilford Conservation Commission Chair, who would like to say a few words about this evening's program. Laura? So thank you everybody for coming out this evening and um, definitely looking forward to a very, what I think will be a very interesting presentation about making our woods work and um, I assume it also means trees in our backyard. <laughs> so I don't personally have a woods, but I walk in them. <laughs> um, so the, uh, as Danielle said, uh, this, is, this program is co-sponsored and it's part of a series and I believe this is the fifth in our Living with Nature series, uh, sponsored um, uh, predominantly by the Conservation Commission, but in collaboration with the Guilford Land Trust and also certainly the library. So I want to uh, you know, officially thank you all for all the wonderful things that you do to help put these programs on and make this educational series uh, available to everyone. Um, I would like also to thank the members of the commission um, and I'm going to read them off to you. First of all, Laura Malice is our co-chair. Uh, she's been on the commission, I think, about three years now. Unfortunately, she can't be here this evening, but actually, um, she gets all the credit for getting this organized, so, uh, so thank you, Laura. Um, Patrizia DeLonardo is our uh, treasurer and secretary and our technical expert, and she's right there making the camera work. Uh, the program, I should mention, will be on Guilford um, Public TV, Patricia, like a week, two weeks, a month, when? Yes, two to three weeks, all right. So we encourage you to watch it. And I will tell you, I have actually, I, 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 every program we've had I've watched, you know, once, you know, to say, well, you know, how does it look? Um, but the, then I've watched it two and three times because I realized the speakers typically have so much information that it's really nice to go back and reflect on some of the comments that they've made. So I encourage you uh, to keep your eye out and um, the programs get even better the second and third time around. Uh, Emily Cello is another of our commissioners. Janet Ainsworth, Janet, wave your hand. Uh, and Sarah Torf as well. And also Pat Keegan. So uh, I want to thank the commissioners very much. and. Uh, and also to mention that we do have, so we have this commission, right? So it's, um, and, and our liaison with the town is Kevin McGee. So Kevin, and Kevin wears many hats and I wrote them down. <laughs> he was our um, director of Envi environmental planning, uh, our GIS administrator, our tree warden, and our inland wetlands administrator. So he wears a lot of hats. Um, but in addition, we have a wonderful volunteer team, and, uh, and I'm putting in a plug uh, in case any of you might enjoy getting out on some of our trails, maybe a trail that would be near to where you live. Um, our Land Stewardship Committee are individuals um, headed by uh, Doug Clark, who, uh, they keep the trails clear, they, they bring their chainsaws. If you are, how many people in here actually enjoy chainsawing? So, so, so if you want to get out there and you know do the gritty thing, um, <laughs> um, so there are there are work parties that um, are just invaluable and they just do it you know, just because they're interested in keeping the trails open and safe. So, if you'd like to participate, um, I did leave a sign up sheet in the back, or if you just are interested in information about the things that we're doing, sign up as well, please. And now I would like to introduce one of our co-sponsors, Sarah Williams. Sarah is a longtime, longtime volunteer with the Guilford Land Conservation Trust. And as I said, she's a, she and the, uh, the trust are co-sponsors for this evening. Um, but uh, Sarah would like to say a few words, so I'll welcome her now. Sarah. Hello, um, so the Land Trust is normally a pretty quiet organization, but I wanted to take a quick opportunity this evening to draw your attention to something that we're working on right now that's particularly special. Um, so the Land Trust is separate of the town. We're a private nonprofit organization. We're run by volunteers entirely. You have to live in Guilford to be on the board. Um, we were started in 1965. Um, I've been with the Land Trust for 15 years now. Um, and the, what I want to tell you about tonight, there, there's a map over there on the easel with a red, looks like a stocking. 
Um, and what that is, is the last remaining interior privately held parcel in Westwoods. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Westwoods is, it's about a thousand acres. Um, it's very special to have a thousand acre forest along the Long Island Sound between New York and Boston. Guilford is privileged to have it. Um, and we are buying that property this year. We're fundraising to pay for it. Um, and, and what those of you, I think, in this room might appreciate, um, I'll do a real quick version of the, the history of this, of this place. Um, so Westwoods, like many forests in New England, used to be sort of carved up to individual woodlots. So you would get a house maybe on Moose Hill Road, and you would get a place to go out behind the house and cut wood for heat or for cooking. Um, so it got really carved up in, in terms of the deeds and the maps. At the center of the forest was a large parcel that was owned by a company called Styles Brick. Some of you may have bricks in your homes, S-T-I-L-E-S. -E um, so they owned it uh, largely to have the wood to fire their kilns, to, to make the, the bricks. So um, in the 1920s, they decided to divest themselves of this, this central parcel, this first parcel. And a gentleman named George Cromie, who was the city forester for New Haven, I, he's got credit for calling it the Elm City, uh, he purchased it from this company because he realized what a spectacular place Westwoods is. Now, for those of you who haven't been there, it's got caves, it's got, I mean, it's really a special spot. Um, so he purchased it, and he sold it to the state of Connecticut for a dollar, and it has been folded into the Cacapons State Forest System. And um, that, that single act of generosity set off many more acts of generosity. So um, in the 1960s in Guilford, like much of the rest of the country, people were falling in love with nature, they were getting out in the woods, and the Conservation Commission and the Land Trust were both newly formed. Um, at that time, the Conservation Commission said, you know, why don't we put some trails in over on that west side of town? Um, it was all private land except for the state forest land. Um, so they hired a trail designer. Many of you have probably cursed this trail designer. If you've been to Westwoods, it's incredibly complicated. Um, but they designed what's, what was the basis for the system that we have today. Um, and so everyone fell in love with this. There were grand trail openings. People were parked all along Dunk Rock Road. There are wonderful pictures of this. It was really the first time people felt like they could get connected to nature. And right as soon as the town of Guilford fell in love with this beautiful forest, a piece of it came up for sale. And they thought, no, we've just fallen in love with this place. We can't lose this property. So they turned to the land trust, and they said, could you help us figure this out? And the land trust at that time had it was started in 1965. It was about three years old. Um, I have good people in this room to keep me honest on these numbers. Um, and they hadn't really done anything quite like this before. They had donated you know, wetlands, which were not protected under the law at that time, um, had been donated to the land trust. So it was kind of a heavy lift, but it was a very first acquisition. Um, 1968, it went on the market. 1969, they closed. It's a little piece on Dunk Rock Road where the kiosk is. When you go into it, there's a little trail right off the road. So that was the beginning of many, many acquisitions that our organization <coughs> has made in this forest. And if you take a look at that map, there are little marks with dates all around. Um, and what we have the opportunity to do this year is to, to wrap this up. Um, in terms of the center, there's some <coughs> peripheral pieces that we might still be able to acquire. Um, but this is really the culmination of, of an effort that our community has taken on. Um, if you look at Connecticut from space, you can see the East River Preserve, and you can see at night, and you can see Westwoods. Um, so it's quite a special place in terms of bird migration, um, endangered plants and animals. It's, it's quite a special thing. So I just want to remind you, if you haven't had a chance to, to go to our website and look at it, to learn more about it. We're trying to raise $250,000. Um, so any help you can, you can make would be great, and please help spread the word. Um, I could take like three questions, if anyone has questions about the land trust or what we're, what we're buying. How did I do? <laughs> any questions? Sarah, um, are you having uh, fundraising events to raise money? Well, what we're, we've done, um, we've done small gatherings and we've done a town-wide mailing to tell everybody who we are and what we're doing. Um, and we probably will have more, probably one more event in the fall. Um, but we're really trying to keep it simple, bare bones, um, and ask for contributions. And the truth is, the land trust protects 3,000 acres in Guilford, 10% of the town. Um, and that has, we have done this this way for 53 years now. Um, and the community is um, it's just spectacular. People in other communities look at us and say, how has Guilford done what you've done? Um, and it's not the land trust. It's the community supporting the land trust. So it's really a special opportunity. So it's over there. Any other questions? Yeah, Jan. I'm leading a hike in there on Memorial Day. 
Memorial Day hike in Westwoods. Okay. A bunch of them is Italian. Okay. <laughs> but my question is, do you have any flyers? I hand up. Yep, I'll give you a chunk. Yes. Actually, I left some on the table up front, so we'll just you take them. Yeah. I'll distribute them. We'll yeah. So yeah, so the only other thing I would ask you is just if you see a notice about a hike that we're doing or something like along these lines, just share it, spread the word. Um, we are so organic. Um, we have no staff. We're just, just people like me who volunteer whenever we can. Um, so if you could just help spread the word. Um, this, people call this the forest that Guilford built um, and that's, we should all get credit for this. So thank you. And um, thank you so much. And so there's the map right here that Sarah pointed out. And right behind our speaker, um, we have two other maps that you may find interesting. Uh, the map on the right is the town of Guilford, and it shows the properties that fall under the purview of the Conservation Commission. So these are properties that our mission for the Conservation Commission is to preserve these properties for future generations. So we have a responsibility, and in every single month we revisit this mission statement as we uh, look at and consider different kinds of uses for the properties, always with the thought in mind of to do no harm to them and to make sure that they're not damaged and they're available for future generations. So that's the map on the right. The map on the left shows all of the designated open spaces in the town, and you will see um, the properties uh, that are owned uh, by the, uh, the Guilford Land Trust, um, the state properties, I think you'll find it very interesting. So uh, as you head out tonight, you might want to take a look at, at all three of those maps. I think, I think these maps are so helpful to kind of to bring into, to put into context some of the things that we talk about and to make you aware of a trail that you might go on to see where it fits in the context of the town and other trails that might be available to you. And on the back we have um, excuse me, maps to all of the trails that, uh, the conserva that are the conservation properties. So uh, take a look on the back there, and I realize that our speaker has some materials as well. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. His name is, uh, T I guess this also, when I'm supposed to ask everyone to turn off their cell phones, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, thank you very much. Um, so our speaker is Tom Worthley. He's an uh, associate extension professor at UConn. Uh, he's an extension forester, and he'll explain a little bit about what that is. He lives in Higginham, uh, and he works at the Extension Center in Haddam. Um, so I will let him tell you a lot more about himself and let him get going with his presentation. Tom? Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I have an office in Haddam. Uh, I go there sometimes. Uh, I spend a couple days a week up at stores. I teach a couple classes. I am involved in some research projects with grad students and that sort of thing. And then uh, my real office is in my truck because I travel all over the place, uh, uh, you know, in interacting with the people who uh, own and manage the forest in a variety of different ways. And um, what really qualifies me to speak is the fact that in Higginham, my wife and I have 16 acres of woodland where we live, and we confront the same issues everybody else does, who is a woodland owner, every day of the week. And uh, I've learned a lot just from that, uh, in, in spite of my professional forestry education. And, um, um, and, it's, uh, and it's helped me quite a bit. I've, you know, in the past, I've worked for the industry. I've worked as a consultant. I've spent the last 20 years with academia for what that's worth. And I got into forestry initially so that I wouldn't have to wear a tie and go to meetings. But uh, that said, here, here we are. And, uh, and uh, what I would like to try to do this evening, first I'm going to give you a little advertisement, and then um, I would like to share with you some thoughts I have about forest stewardship, forest management. You know, the, the active hands-on aspects of forest management that are more than just, now we own some land, let's run a trail through there someplace, and don't do anything else. All right? um, sometimes that's the right thing to do. But other times, there's, there are other benefits that you might be missing if you're not taking an active role in the management of the property. And um, 
I have two examples. I'll apologize up front. There's lots of words, and I'll go through them. Um, and it's only because it's an example of the level of detail that we can we can address at times. And if we spend a lot of time on the first example, we don't need to look at the second one. But um, it all depends on the interests of the group. How many of you are actually woodland owners here, anywhere from two to you know two thousand acres? So, yeah. Okay. And uh, land trust members. <coughs> Conservation Commission members, all of the above. Um, so, state of Connecticut, 75%, 75% of the land area of the state of Connecticut is under a tree canopy. All right? Under a tree canopy, now that includes all the urban trees and all the suburban trees. About 60% can be cons of the land area can be considered forest land in the traditional sense, rural sense of the word. Okay. Now, the forest land is partly owned by public entities, mostly owned by private individuals and private entities, and people who are families, individual families and farmers, you know, that identifiable people, not land trusts, not game clubs, not church camps, you know, but, but actual people, family, forest owners, Occupy about half the forest land. Okay. Half the forest land is in private hands. We could throw a fence around it and keep everybody out of the world. Um, about half of that is parcels 25 acres and smaller. And that adds up to about 130,000 people in the state of Connecticut. The rest of it, 25 acres and more. That's about 10,000 people. All right. So the constituency that I find myself speaking to more and more and more are the people with the smaller parcels because the, the big parcels get a lot of attention from the, the consulting foresters and the forest industry and all this kind of stuff. And they do a good job at what they do. Um, and we uh, were confronted with a half of our private forest resource not getting any attention from anybody. So. Um, Take what we can from it, the examples that I show. We'll scale it down a little bit to whatever uh, size you're thinking of, and um, uh, you know perhaps there's something there that you can that you can use. Uh, the um, the image I have here is from uh, um, a website called uh, CT Ecos, spelled exactly how it's uh, right at the top there. CT Eco, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it stands for Connecticut Environmental Conditions Online. And um, they served up a variety of ways of making maps. And um, I've opened up an aerial image of uh, the North Guilford and North Brantford area. You can see Lake Gillard over there. And, um, and one of the cool things that they have here is also a um, an image created from light detection and ranging equipment called LIDAR, which allows you to see the terrain and the, and the topography. And you can look at this topography and you can understand why in 1860 everybody wanted to move west, where it's flat <laughs> and there are no rocks. <laughs> um, I once asked a guy in Indiana, you know why they decided to plant trees that on this in this area he says it's a marginal agricultural soil well what makes it a mar marginal agricultural soil well the topsoil here is only six feet deep <laughs> you know, so well good. they'll grow some good trees but um, um, so Sarah showed you the um, the area down in uh, at Westwoods, let's see if we can find that. We'll go south in town here. There's 95. And we can zoom in a little bit. And we, in this area here, is that where yeah. we're looking at? Yeah, right? down a little bit. A little down a little bit more. There's Lost Lake. This okay. Is, this is Lost Lake right here. Okay. 
Oh, I see. There's 140, or is that the railroad? No, the railroad. No, the railroad and 146. Yeah. Okay. In the railroad. In the railroad. Okay. Yeah, 146 in the railroad. Okay. So this is the area where uh, where they're uh, looking at uh, purchasing the property. You can see why Westwoods is such an interesting place. You know, wetlands, water, surface water, lots of ledges, lots of very interesting places to, to look. Um, so the, uh, the CT Eco website has all these different viewers. I happen to be clued in here to the elevation viewer, the, the, the LiDAR viewer. Here you can look at the 2016 imagery. There's another one with imagery uh, posted. Um, that, oops, sorry. Um, where they have a whole bunch of different layers, you know, 2016, 2014, it's spring and summer, uh, and um, so it's, a, it's an interesting place to visit. They also, uh, on this website, at a different, in a different page, they have places where you can print out simple maps of your town, uh, showing, you know, whatever you want to show, wetlands, prime farmland soils, all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's self-explanatory. They, uh, they, they have some, uh, you know, informational paragraphs for you to be able to look at there. And so if you're interested in exploring around, looking at what was going on in your own backyard in 2016, why I recommend you uh, uh, to uh, Kinetic, to CT Eco. So, so with that, what I'm hoping to talk about this evening is uh, uh, forests and wildlife habitats. Um, and, um, oops, let's go. This is a sensitive, uh, sensitive place. And um, what we think about when we do an assessment, what kind of goes into planning uh, for activities to uh, enhance our enjoyment of properties. We just looked at this. Uh, I had copied these images. Uh, here's a summertime um, uh, image of uh, the North Guilford area. Um, and you can see when you take the leaves off that the, uh, it's a pretty... Um, it's a pretty chopped up landscape, lots of small parcels intermixed with larger parcels, and uh, uh, as, as you can see on the map, lots of conserved areas that are important to have, like these wetlands and that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, it's a pretty, uh, pretty mixed bag, which uh, creates its own, uh, uh, its own management challenges. But um, I usually think about this from the standpoint of whoever the landowner is and what their interests are and uh, what sort of questions that they might ask themselves if they're thinking about their own property. You know, what's most important to me and what are the things I do enjoy, uh, I enjoy doing. Uh, places I like to visit on my property. Bring these right up, uh, right up front to uh, um, uh, figure out what, what are the key things that uh, um, build for you the, your, the reasons that you're a landowner. You know, what are, how do you benefit from owning land? What, what rewards do you get out of it? What satisfactions do you, uh, do you uh, <coughs> excuse me, receive? I've built a career on the notion that if a private woodland owner is deriving some benefit, is deriving some satisfaction from being a woodland owner, then the woodlands will stay woodlands. They won't be inclined to want to convert it to something else. And um, so... When we think about management, I, I don't necessarily like to think about management for its own sake. Certainly we like to think about the health of the forest, addressing natural resource issues like tree diseases or invasive insects or that sort of thing, but management just for the sake of management without addressing the landowner's needs is um, you know, going down the wrong path. So we talk to landowners about, well, what are the conditions that you enjoy the most? Is, is, the, is the condition of your forest meeting your needs? Is it uh, uh, you're finding you have too many invasive thorny shrubs? You're, you're not seeing the wildlife that you used to see. Um, your trees are getting mature and um, uh, you know, becoming a, over mature, beginning to die off, the, the, the woods are thinning themselves out, can I take advantage of salvaging some of that and, uh, you know, for uh, whatever value the trees are worth? And what's my, what's my land capable of producing? These are all questions that we, uh, we want to, uh, 
to address with landowners. And from those conversations, we uh, uh, begin to develop some ideas about how, uh, how the forest, how the landowner wishes to manage their forest. So out of the book, we'll give you this little definition for forest and wildlife habitat management, and it's about applying ecological principles to manipulate vegetative conditions in a scientific manner to achieve a very specific set of goals. And uh, so uh, we look at uh, what sort of species we might be interested in encouraging or perhaps discouraging as the case may be and um, begin with, uh, with doing some kind of an assessment. And uh, this is a process of identifying physical and topographical biological characteristics. There are guidelines online that help landowners to do this kind of things themselves. You can buy books. Um, you, can engage, you can engage the services of a consultant to walk around the property with you and uh, look at different uh, characteristics and uh, come up with maps and make some field observations. Sometimes we use uh, sampling uh, techniques to do uh, some quantification and come up with descriptions of things. In the world of forestry, we call this forest inventory, and it's very quantitative in nature. We measure trees, we determine species mixes, what is the age structure of the trees, do we have trees that are all the same age, or do we have trees that are different ages in the same stand, um, what's the condition of the trees, uh, what's the size distribution of the trees, that sort of thing. I can tell you at home, on my property in Higginham, the main the main canopy, the overstory trees, are all the same age. They're all about 108 years old. And um, that stand of trees initiated following a, uh, a harvest for manufacture of charcoal. All the trees were cut, they were piled into piles, and you know the, the, the wood was cooked uh, until it was uh, a charcoal, uh, a pile of charcoal that was hauled away for the the metalworking industry and uh, um, and everything grew from sprouts from there and I have big trees I have small trees and they're all about the same age and um, some of them are old trees at 108 years some of them are middle-aged trees at 108 years and some of them are still pretty young trees at 108 years and so uh, there's a wide variety of things that I can perhaps do on that property knowing just that fact in wildlife habitat assessment, a lot of times the assessment is more qualitative than quantitative, but um, uh, we look at features, we look at areas, we look at types of vegetative communities, we look at cover, um, we look at live vegetation as well as dead vegetation, and um, uh, you know, take note of all these kinds of things. Uh, in this, uh, in this. Uh, um, assessment uh, activity. We generally come up with a, um, a series of maps that uh, help to tell the story uh, from topography, wetlands, soil types, and that sort of thing. Um, here's, a, here's a series we can look at. Uh, here's a parcel of land with the, the boundary showing, showing the location of it. This is up in northwestern Connecticut. And we can look at the, uh, the aerial imagery and begin to sort out um, different vegetative communities just from the color and texture. Oh, you know, obviously this is different from what's around surrounding it. This is obviously different than something that's surrounding it. This area has a different sort of color and texture than this area here. I may not know exactly what that is, but I know that they're different. And when I, as a forester, when I go and look at these areas, I'm going to take notes about this area and keep them separate from the notes I take about this area here, so I can uh, come up with uh, accurate descriptions of what the conditions are in those areas. And it's the first, this first crack we take at, uh, at sorting things out. If we look at that uh, in black and white, well, now all of a sudden I can recognize, oh, well, this has pine trees or some other kind of evergreens in it. Same thing over here. That's why it was different than the area that was, uh, that was next to it. We can look at the topography. Um, obviously, uh, here we have uh, this great big mountain in the middle of the property. I would think that what's growing here on this steep slope is going to be different than what's growing over here on the flatland. So I'm getting more and more clues all the time about 
what I might expect to find there. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, soil types. And I uh, won't go into that, but uh, uh, this, many years ago, uh, for decades, the Soil Conservation Service and now the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, uh, made a great effort to map all the soils around. And uh, while the, uh, the information is not really, really precisely accurate, it's a good guideline as to what you might expect to find. We live in a world that was once covered with glaciers, and the conditions that the glaciers left behind is a real mixed bag of different soil conditions uh, that vegetation has, has grown on since. And so we, uh, we, we make a crack at uh, drawing some lines around things that we think are uh, unique and separate uh, vegetative habitats and go and have a look. And as we walk around, we make note of, uh, of features that we might find. Uh, here's, my friend, uh, here's my friend Jerry, who's got 80 acres in, in Higginum, looking at habitat features. What are the habitat features in this photograph? Anybody want to guess? Don't know. What's that? The wall. The wall is a habitat feature. For who? For what? Chipmunks. Chipmunks. Yeah. And <laughs> snakes. Okay. The two kind of go together, don't they? Here's a big cavity in a dead cedar tree. And that's a, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, red cedar, it's truly a juniper, but it's a red cedar, and um, that tree is still standing, you know, dead 10 years later because it's slow to rot, and that cavity will be a, a cavity that will be used for all, kind of, all kinds of things in different seasons all through the, all through the year. So um, things like that are, are things that I would note on my map as I go and explore the property. Uh, wetland areas, this is a wooded wetland area on Jerry's property. You can see the skunk cabbage, and uh, uh, the curious thing is this uh, stand of, um, of um, um, sassafras trees that are right at the edge of it, right behind him there. That's, that was a kind of a cool thing. And uh, um, certain birds are building nests, Phoebes are building nests in the ledges there, and uh, uh, in the, on the left-hand side, and uh, then he's got this uh, very interesting kind of dead old uh, cavity tree at the boundary of the property and uh, um, would have been an interesting tree to run through the sawmill and see how all those bumps <laughs> turned out. But you know, perhaps it's doing more, more value uh, uh, as, a, as a wildlife feature. So we asked some questions now to put uh, some, some quantification to it. Now how large is my property? The person with 300 acres is going to approach this whole process differently than the person with 30 acres or the person with 3 acres. But they all can do a similar kind of assessment. The person with 3 acres is probably looking more at individual plants, shrubs, trees. And the person with 30 acres is not thinking about animals that require a huge territory. They're thinking about something else. And the person with 300 acres, well, you know, they have a wide variety of options available to them. So, uh, what kind of different habitat features might I find on my property? How many are there? Um, what's the condition of the neighbor's properties? You know, am I the last island of woodland in the middle of a developed part of town, or am I the one woodland area surrounded by other woods that add up to, you know, a thousand acres? So, um, you know, all these things uh, uh, make a difference in, in what one might decide to do. We can measure road frontage, we can measure stream length, we can measure stone walls, we can get it all on the map and uh, help us to quantify things. Um, we look at quality considerations too. Um, what about vertical structure, what do I mean by that? Trees that are standing? Well, trees are standing, okay. And do I have vegetation that's all the same height with nothing in between? Or do I have vegetation of different heights and stages? Do I have some meadows that are partially grown up and some edges that, you know, build to a forest canopy? Or is it a hard edge from field to forest? Um, what's the vertical structure? Do I have a diversity of species out there? Um, and what are, the, what are the age of things? I just went through an age... Uh, analysis about my own property. Um, what's curious is, uh, you know, all of those 
all of those hundred year old hundred years old trees that live a long time, sometimes they behave like young trees. You give them an opportunity to grow, and boom, all of a sudden they grow like crazy. So, um, are there critical habitats? And there's ways of finding that out. There's uh, uh, online references that you can look at. CT Eco would have one of them that would show you whether there's a documented. Uh, uh, location of, say, a threatened or endangered species uh, uh, nearby or on your property or something like that. Uh, and then you can write away to the Natural Diversity Database and get more information about it. Um, what are the spatial considerations? What's going on nearby? Um, we just mentioned, are, are you uh, in, a, in a big landscape that's full of uh, natural features or uh, are you in a developing landscape? And what's the relative sizes of the properties and habitats? All these things are, are things we want to know about. So um, here's an example. I'm walking around with a landowner and I hear them say, you know, I used to see more red-bellied zebra wings on my property. Well, I don't know what a red-bellied zebra wings is. I just made that up. Um, I used to see these on my property, and I don't anymore. And I'm thinking to myself, that was something they enjoyed that they're not enjoying anymore. Okay? And so I'm thinking, well, this landowner would like to modify things to see if they could bring that critter back onto the property because they enjoyed seeing them. So we have to ask, what are the habitat features that that red-bellied zebra wing needs? Okay, the habitat features, food, source of shelter, water, and space. And the answer to that question describes the desired condition. Here's what we need if we want to see these critters on the property. Does that condition exist out there? Probably not. It's probably grown up past its, you know, the ideal habitat conditions and changed over time. That's the, that's the thing about not doing anything. Change will still happen, even if you don't do anything. Okay? So you can take control of the changes or you can, uh, you know, see what happens. Okay? But uh, this is what happened in this case. They've lost the habitat for this critter and now they would like to have it back. So we go to our, uh, we go to our Google references or we go to the Connecticut Wildlife Division website and we find out the, the habitat that's favorable to red-bellied zebra wings. And what they require, we find out, is an irregular six-acre patch, at least six, acre, at least six acres in size, warm season grasses, with two acres of mixed native berry bushes nearby. There's what happened. They used to have a meadow, it had, it had bushes on the edges, and now it's all grown up to woody vegetation, and so the zebra wings moved on. And so, they have a potential to locate habitat like this on the southwest portion of the property, and so now they have to figure out, well, what grass species do we need, and specify that, and what are the numbers and types of berries that that bird is going to eat, and specify that. And we have the, um, the makings of a prescription, the, the actions needed to convert our existing habitat to this is what is eventually prescribed in the plant. Here's what you do first, here's what you do next, here's when you plant the bushes, here's the source of where you get them, here's a government agency with some money and technical assistance that can help you out, you know. Uh, all of those things are, uh, are um, part of uh, what goes into that, that management plan or that habitat plan. So here's a scenario, uh, meet Hansel and Gretel. And, uh, you know, they own an old farm that they inherited from their, um, you know, their elders and uh, uh, their children are grown and kind of moved on. They haven't quite decided yet what they're going to do with the property. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there's some things they enjoy and they're very specific about it. You know, Hansel wishes he could uh, bring woodcock back to the property. It used to be quite common. They would go hunting and they would hunt woodcock. They're also known as timber doodles. It's a little uh, upland game bird species and uh, uh, quite unusual. Uh, here's a picture of one right here. If they sit still in their nest, you can't see them. You can practically step on one and it won't move until you're right there. And then it flies right straight up in front of your face and then phew, goes off like that, making a very funny, uh, funny noise. And so it'll scare you half to death. Um, and that's its defensive mechanism. But it, um, 
it's, it's an unusual shape. The eyes are mounted very high on the head, and it has this long, um, this long beak that it uses for probing into the soil because its main, main food source is, is, um, is earthworms. So the, and the tip of the beak is what they call prehensile, meaning they can, it can do this. So it can probe down into the soil, grab a worm if it finds it, and pull it, pull it out. Grubs, things like that. Uh, but in the meantime, it can still watch <laughs> what's going on out here, you know? So uh, it can defend itself. So it's a very neat little bird, and um, it's been declining in numbers in Connecticut because of loss of proper habitat conditions. And Hans likes the bird. He knows it's in trouble. He knows he's got conditions on his property that might be suitable, so that's what he wants to do. Now, Greta, like, she just likes bird watching, but they also have horses and other things like that. And um, so they bring in a professional who looks at the property and does one of these assessments, makes one of those maps like we just described. You know, here's the, here's the upland woodlands, here's the old fields, here's an active pasture, here's some wetland areas. Um, uh, you know, some other things that are mapped out, and um, here's what you have to work with, okay? Here's what you have to work with. And um, the, uh, they can quantify all this. Now, I'm not going to go through all these details, but, you know, let it be known. They can measure the sizes. They can specify just what they have and list it all in the management plan. And then they look up woodcock. What does woodcock need? Well, the woodcock is a specialist. It doesn't show up just anywhere. We have specialists and we have generalists. A robin is a generalist. White-tailed deer is a generalist. They show up everywhere. And they can adapt to just about anything. A lot of our animals are very strict specialists, and we require a courtship area. <laughs> I'm a male woodcock, and I need this two acres of grass so I can do my special dance to attract the mate. Like that. What's that? Funny. You know people like I know people like that. <laughs> it doesn't vary all that much from species to species. <laughs> and the female woodcock is very fussy. So, you know, if you don't have the right singing ground, forget it, you know. So, um, and then you need a feeding area. Where are you going to go to find those earthworms? The highest, driest, rockiest soil you can find? No, it needs to be moist, soft soil, protected area. Uh, so we need some of that, all right? And then because they nest on the ground, they need a place that's, that's very dense, that lots and lots of stems per acre. You walk in these mature upland woodlands and you have a, a big trees, you might have 100, 150 trees per acre. Okay, I'm talking about 10,000 stems per acre, 20,000 stems per acre. Very, very dense. If you're a woodcock and you're trying to escape from a predator, you can get into there, hide yourself in the leaves, and that hawk or that fox is never going to be able to follow you. All right? So they, they, to protect their young, they need to have this very dense cover, all right? And then a summer roosting area, when all the work is done, a place to hang out until it's time to fly south for the winter. So um, you need to be able to eat and all this kind of stuff. So they look at the property and decide where, what do they have that satisfies those conditions? What do they need to create, okay? And so they realize they can, they can find two types of, or crew, either find or create two types of, oak, of young forest growth or early successional species growth for that dense cover. And um, either a managed area of reverting fields that they mow periodically or go into one of their um, forested areas and make openings. Cut an area, let it grow back up, and move on to another area you know, in a few years. So they create this very dense uh, these dense patches of young forest growth. There's a pamphlet in the back about the young forest project that they're that, that they're promoting, and they can uh, they can turn these um, these condition requirements into specific objectives that are um, specific to the property. And I won't read them all, but uh, um, you know, one has to do with uh, managing those uh, those areas that are already open, that brushland. Um, um, 
objective four down here, 14 acres of old fields and orchards are managed by rotational grazing. So they let the horses in there sometimes, and then other times they don't have them in there. And it uh, gives the, the bird sufficient time to do its singing, and then when they're all done with that, they, um, uh, they let the horses go back and grade. Um, Objective number three, 10 acres of seedling and sapling, young forest habitat created on a sustained basis for shrubland birds, okay? Um, I think if I remember what the initial map said, they had like 70 acres of upland forest, okay? So they could take 10 acres at a time every couple of years and cut it and wait well, maybe not every couple of years, maybe wait five years and then do another 10 acres, and wait five years and do another 10 acres, and wait five years and do another 10 acres. And by the time they get around to all 70 acres, then they, you know, they have another mature forest to, or maturing forest to, uh, to start all over with. And so they have this multiple age condition on the property that, that will satisfy these habitat needs for a long, long time. So then they come up with the management prescription. What are the actions to take, just like I uh, was describing to you? Then you have to think about, well, how am I going to do it? Do we, uh, um, do we have a person with a, you know, by hand with a chainsaw working on 10,000 stems per acre? I don't think so. <laughs> no, maybe in the upland forest, but uh, um, a lot of times they'll bring in heavy machinery for these things. And um, um, the... Uh, uh, you know, get the get the job done in a in a slightly different way. So, for an example, here's a here's a machine called a brontosaurus. Okay, it's a it's a hydraulic uh, backhoe style machine that uh, um, has a rotating cutter head mounted on the on the arm of it that they just lower down and it chews up everything and leaves it all as chips on the ground and. Um, where are we doing this? Create feeding and day cover by managing the 20-acre core forested wetland along the river riparian corridor. Every, we're going to do five acres every four years, okay? So they're never, in 20, on 20 acres they're going to be able to do that five times, four acres at a time, five times. So um, five acres, no, I'm sorry, five acres every four years instead of four acres every five years. I suppose you could do it either way, but uh, uh, five acres every four years. So they cut five acres, they do nothing for the next three years, and in the fourth year they cut another five acres, they do nothing for uh, you know the next four years, and pretty soon they have this multiple age group of this um, young forested wet area. Now, there's the key phrase. This is Core forested wetland. Now if I went to your wetland commission, I said, I want to do a clear cut in some wetlands. <laughs> How do you think they would respond to that? <laughs> well, you know, after they get done flipping out and throwing me out of my tail. I, but if we can explain that, you know, this is how beavers manage the forest for, you know, umpteen million years before we got here. Why, uh, they might understand that, that, 100-year-old red maple stand in the middle of a forested wetland is not really a natural condition because they never would have gotten that old. And uh, that young forest habitat was a before European settlement and before the fires were taken out of the environment uh, and before the beavers were extirpated was actually created mostly by those natural forces. This is how these species managed to survive at that time. They didn't have brontosauruses back then. So in some places, the, the, the young forest that's being created is, uh, you know, sometimes involves a, a contractor with some heavy equipment. Now, uh, in many places you go, and I'll be first to admit this, when somebody uses the word forest management, what they really mean is logging. They're using the word forest management as a euphemism for timber harvesting. Now, timber harvesting has its place, don't get me wrong. If you want to manage for timber, there's a series of, you know, uh, uh, activities you can do that bring uh, uh, 
you know, contractors in that, you know, in these actions are designed to grow the best trees you can and eventually harvest them, you know, for some purpose, and that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. But there are also timber harvesting and logging enterprises that don't really think along these lines unless you tell them, okay? Now, you can engage a contractor who's skilled, has the right equipment, if we know what we're going to have them do, and it's all spelled out ahead of time, most of them are more than happy to do what you want them to do. And um, uh, it's a matter of getting them at the right time and in the right place and with the right equipment. And uh, uh, you can get a, a, a quality piece of, of work done. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a mess. You know, this is a mess to look at. You know, they're going to clear, what did we say, 14 acres, 10 acres, 10 acres? at a time, okay? Clear it. There's a lot of woody material on the ground. There's a lot of bare ground where there was trees before. It can be a striking change, but the whole idea is not the cleared ground, but what it's going to be two years from now and five years from now. And that's when you bring your friends back for the tour. You don't take them right away. <laughs> you take them, you know, three years from now or four years from now. Um, Although, what was it? I had an interesting experience over the, the fall. We had done an oak regeneration harvest on 30 acres up at Yukon, on Yukon Forest, in which I made big, wide swaths of, uh, where we opened up the canopy. So there was big, wide swaths of open space interspersed by, you know, in, intact um, pieces of the canopy. And, um, but to let a lot of light in, and we had whacked the whole lower, um, lower, layers of the forest, all those, the, the understory stuff. So all I had was this very high canopy with these big wide areas to let in the sunlight and lots of ambient light underneath and a, and a very impressive carpet of woody material spread all over the ground, branches and tops and stuff like that. And, um, and the idea of that was to protect my seedlings from being browsed by the deer, okay? And have enough light to bring those oak seedlings along. So I took, a, I took a group of people who just were out for a hike one day, you know, part of the Walktober event they have up there. And we walked through the forest, we talked about different types of things, and we come on to this area from the backside, we walked into it, and the lady stopped and she goes, this is beautiful. <laughs> and it was, the last, it was the last reaction I expected to hear. But, um, uh, you know, I expected people to say, this is a mess, you know, look at all this woody material all scattered all over the place. But um, uh, I'm looking forward over the next few years to watching the, the seedlings grow and the, and the sprouts come up and, and, and see how that develops and see if that worked as well as we hoped it would in a place where we're not allowed to hunt the deer. So uh, anyway, um, I digress. So in the end, they've come up with a, a habitat management plan that is accompanied by a map in which all these... Uh, all these different colors and symbols mean something different in terms of the action they're going to take and when they're going to do it. So, you know, this yellow may represent that 10 acres of clear cut, you know, eight years from now, that kind of thing. And so, um, and then there's areas, of course, where they're not going to do anything. They've decided to leave it undisturbed. But uh, all their actions, their whole plan is spelled out on this map. And, uh, and in a document, that guides them, okay, this year, here's what you're supposed to do. Now, the beauty for woodland owners is that in the, in the last farm bill, they qualified as uh, uh, producers and eligible for assistance to do conservation activities. And if you're a woodland owner who wants to engage in habitat management and um, you're going to do something that benefits some species of, of interest, um, they can come and help you to do this. They'll, they'll bring a technical specialist to help you do the plan, and they'll provide financial assistance to help pay the cost of things that would out otherwise be a, an out-of-pocket expense. Okay? So if you're going to go into an old apple orchard, for example, and you're going to rent a machine to go in there and 
do that periodic mowing and so forth and so on. There's no cash coming back to you on that. So this is something that would be an out-of-pocket expense. But because you're doing it, and if you do it to the right specification, they're willing to help out with the, with the expense of doing that. On the other hand, if you're clearing 10 acres of forest land, where the forest is mature and the trees are big enough to be of value from a timber standpoint, why, you know, um, you'd be expected to derive, uh, you know, a profit from that. And uh, uh, unless your forester isn't very good at it, but uh, um, most of them <laughs> know enough to, to, to get uh, competitive bids for your uh, timber and uh, you would be able to get that job done and all of the, all the specifications complete uh, uh, based on the income that you would derive from the value of the wood. So, any questions so far? Looking at this, um, you're really talking about a fairly long time span. Yeah. So, yeah. you might have a family, let's say they're not that young, they're 30 or 40 years old. Yep. And to get to the end point, they're going to be 80, 90 years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it, it takes people that really have a long time frame. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. I can only speak from. Uh, and, and, and you take a generational perspective, and I can only speak from my own, from my own standpoint. You know, my wife and I live on this 16 acres in Higginham. We raised two children there, and one lives out in Washington State because she's in the army, and another one lives over in Rhode Island. They're fairly close by, and they have their own children, and they have places on that property that they associate with their growing up experience. You know, the little place they would go camp out with their friends and cook hot dogs and drink Kool-Aid and build a little campfire and that sort of thing. And later when they were older in college, they would come and they would camp out there and build a little campfire and cook hot dogs, but they would drink something other than Kool-Aid. You know? um, the, the point is that they, and, I, we, and we, when we do something that makes a change, whether it's I'm going to thin this area out to tap maple trees or I'm going to open up the meadow a little bit more or something like that. We bring them in on it and consult them. I want to make sure I don't cut their favorite tree down by mistake or, or something like that. But um, uh, I like to think that as we get older that um, they will continue to value the property. And if life circumstances you know, allow them not to continue to own it when we're not here, then at least uh, somebody who else comes along will be a, uh, what I might consider a, a conservation buyer, somebody who would be looking for a property for just that very same purpose. So that's kind of the way I think about it. But uh, many people do have that generational, um, that generational uh, approach to things. And, and here it's not about making money. It's not like I'm struggling with the family farm you know, and I can barely make a living, and I have three sons, and I expect them to make a living on the same farm. No, <laughs> you know, um, it's more just for the enjoyment, satisfaction, and uh, you know, other intrinsic benefits that we that we derive. And maybe a little income now and then to help pay the pay the taxes or something. Can you talk about the complexity of working this approach in? wetlands you can do a uh, you can do an, an inventory or an assessment of a wetland area in terms of identifying species quantifying them proportionally we have mostly this uh, uh, sweet pepper bush and then we have a little of this and we have a little of that something else you, there's ways of doing um, representative sampling to get a stem count if you want. Um, as far as actions in wetlands, um, those would be defined by what you're trying, what the conditions that you're trying to create, and why. Okay. Now, if I'm trying to replicate what a, what a beaver did you know, years ago, without actually having a beaver on staff. Um, <clears throat> and I can't build a dam and, and cause it to wash away. 
Uh, the, the next closest thing I can do is, is go around on foot with my chainsaw and just drop everything on the ground and leave it there. No heavy equipment, no nothing. And I've actually made this suggestion to a couple of land trusts, and they've gone out and done it, you know. They, they have a red maple swamp, they cut a third of it one year, they come back in three or four years, they cut another third of it, you know, and come back in three or four years, they cut another third of it, and now they have this very dense um, growth. Um, they generally talk to their local wetlands commission in advance. Um, they either get a, a waiver or they take out a permit and uh, you know explain what they're doing. And as long as you're not changing the course of the wetlands and you're not placing fill in the wetlands and you're not building a structure in the wetlands, why you should be okay. Does that help? It does. Thank okay. You. So, you know, in the end, you have a. a you know, a plan, but as you go along through those years, you want to kind of measure your progress and you want to have some um, some metrics identified in advance that you're going to use. Uh, how fast are my trees growing? How many woodcock do I see every year? Um, you know, what are the number of deer that we've seen and harvested and that sort of thing uh, will help you know whether your, uh, whether your plan is successful or it needs to be modified somewhere along the way. So that was the end of my first example. Now, if you'd like to simply discuss from there about different scales and different operations, great. If you want to really get into the, the nerdy stuff with me, I have a, a wood products example here that I could show you. Well, I have a question. Um, so the town of Guilford has these properties, and yeah. um, I, at least one of the properties uh, we just learned like two weeks ago there was a forest management plan put in place. Mm -hmm. However, that was before anyone currently on the commission um, was aware of it or participated in it. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you, when you have like town properties, so it's not a family, right. and you have people you know, on a board and off a board and you lose that, you lose that memory and yeah. you lose that that core understanding in the beginning of where you wanted to be. How how do you how do you manage that in an entity where there's a turnover of people and personalities and knowledge? Is there a strategy around that that we could consider? Well, the first thing I would suggest is drag out that old management plan if you can get your hands on it and then see what it says, and um, share it with the current membership of the board, whoever it might be, and find out from them, does, does this align with what we think our mission is, okay? And um, there are exercises you can go through um, to help everybody get on the same page with respect to what the mission of the, whatever group it is. And, um, The best way I can illustrate this is maybe try to try to do an example here. Let's think of um, let's think of a scenario. Um, does somebody here have a a conservation interest that they have, or a, 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 a species, an animal, or bird, or something that they're interested in that they would? Want? We uh, we've lived in a place for about forty years. And about 10 years ago, uh, we saw a bluebird. And bluebird. Never seen one uh, prior to that. A little bit of research. And I now have a, uh, a group of bluebirds that come every year to the same house. Yep. That I, yep. that I put up. As a matter of fact, I uh, took it down one time and I had read just in passing that they pass by sometimes in the winter. Yeah. Yep their uh, uh, migration route. No, I don't put it up and keep it up in the winter. I put it up, I'm walking away from it, and <laughs> right in there was a bluebird. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. I had a very similar experience. We were, um, you know, we had done this harvest I told you about, you know, that had all these big gaps in the canopy, and it was towards the end as we were cleaning up and wrapping things up and taking the last of the firewood out of it and so forth and so on. It was in the springtime of 2016, and as we're leaving, Baltimore Orioles are dropping into the area and checking it out, you know. 
the Baltimore Oriole doesn't want to build a nest where there's a continuous canopy because the squirrels will get to it. They want to build their nest on the edge of an opening, okay? And where, you know, a squirrel is going to be at risk if it goes way out there. You know, so all of a sudden, this patch of woods was very interesting to the Baltimore Oriole. Now, let me ask you, why are you interested in bluebirds? Why do you care? Well, uh, because they're not as populous as they once were. Okay, and why does that matter to you? <laughs> they were sort of driven away by sparrows. Yep, yeah, yeah. They eat insects. They eat insects, okay. There you go. And why would you care that they eat insects? I don't like mosquitoes. You don't like mosquitoes. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm teasing these folks, but you sit down with this, this group that you're managing with, and when somebody expresses an idea, we need more bluebirds, we need more red-bellied well zebra wings or something. Why? Because they're rare. Why do we care about that? Well, this brings, when you can no longer ask, answer the question why, it gets right down to your core values. You know, this matters to me just because. Okay. And it's an important thing to do. And, and this can be true of a group as well as an individual. And you can identify any number of important values to your organization. And then every objective you develop, every management activity you develop, would need to ultimately come back to serving one of those core values that yeah. you have. Okay. Yeah, so I think, right, to make sure it's clearly articulated, not just what you're going to do, but back to your yeah. objectives. Yeah. So, um, one of the core values of the Guilford Land Trust is to protect open space. Okay. And we could add, you know, uh, just for its intrinsic value, but we could go through that. Why is that important? Why is it important to have, well, for the character of the community? Why is that important? You know, so, um, and we would get down to half a dozen things that um, is true about every project that they do. And when it comes to management, thinking about active management, from those core values, you can identify key, key objectives that um, work, are, are more actionable, they're more short-term, they're measurable, that um, address those, those core values. And then, when you come up with some activity idea, it's going to be along one of those threads. And then it will make sense to everybody in the organization. All right. In the back. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Young lady. Thank you. <laughs> um, what about invasives? How do you usually, on a large, it's filled with winged iguanas, what do you do? I mean, do you spray? Do you just do cutting every spring and fall? How do you... What kind of advice do you give? Well, um, with a group, you know, like a land trust, like the head of land trust, we would all have to be on the same species as why invasives are not in our interest. Right. And, but, um, and then in the end, we would have to look at some of those other values. Are we open to the use of chemicals on our property or not? And if not, then how do we approach this problem? But, um, Depending on the species that you're trying to control, uh, that you're interested in controlling, there are various control methods that uh, a person can apply or a group can apply. And um, you wing you wing you on us, you said. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the one of the four that are most important to me. A Japanese barberry is public enemy number one, and then which. Well, knotweed is an edge problem, and we don't find knotweed in the woods, you know, so I'm less concerned about that at this point in time. I'm more concerned about uh, oriental bittersweet, multiflora rose, winged euonymus, and then some of the other, other things after that. But um, sometimes the, the problem is, is so big that it just seems inter insurmountable, like, how am I going to do this? So, uh, a couple of things that I suggest to individuals or small groups of volunteers, tackle that area 
that you know you can get done. You know, that it's not a full armpit high stand of Japanese barberry, that it's a few scattered bushes, okay, whatever control method you choose. So you come away with a sense of success. Or if, if all you have is these big stretches, divide it into sections, you know, and just, the rest of it is a problem for another day, let's just focus on this here, let's get this done. And even if all you do is a tenth of an acre, that armpit high stand of Japanese barberry did not show up overnight. It took 30 or 40 years for it to develop. And so, you know, if you get it all out of there, a tenth of an acre, why, it's not all going to grow back right away. But you can work on the next tenth of an acre and the next tenth of an acre and, uh, and then keep the other one in control. So, you know, doable chunks, one, you know, one step at a time. Does that help? It does. It just... Whenever I go for a walk and I just see the whole, like at East River, it's just the whole understory is yeah. invasive. It just seems like, mm -hmm. how yeah. could you possibly tackle this? Yeah. Yeah. About a helicopter just going inside. <laughs> well, you know, and there, there are people who, who do that. And with, with Barberry and with Multiflora Rose in particular, you have windows of opportunity in the spring and in the fall when you can, because they leaf out before everything else, and you can spray without, uh, the fall is probably a better time because all the movement in the plant in the spring is in the wrong direction. You want the herbicide to go down. Yeah. But uh, um, you can spray when nothing else is active and you're not going to hit non-target species. Hand hand over here. Yeah, I've been trying to do little pieces at a time and I'm getting poison ivy. It's <laughs> <laughs> underneath and now it's exposed. And thriving, I'm sure. Not what? And thriving. Well, the poison ivy's native anyway. Right, but I, but I, I swell up, I can get, I've had like three cases already. Well, that's, um, I don't know what, don't do. Know what to do except, um, I'm not a I don't know what to do except arm yourself with long sleeves and uh, some of that. that. It, it, it kind of flips up sometimes when oh, I'm pulling okay. something. Or my nose is dripping and I do this. <laughs> I get it from my boot laces when I untie my yeah. boots, you know, so. Um, the um, techno uh, or oh, wash with soap and water right, right away, you know, right, that sort right. of thing, you know. Right. That's all I can suggest. And you probably are more severely allergic than some other people mm -hmm. are. And, um, you know, we have found that, you know, we clear an acre of Japanese barberry and we come back the next year and it, this whole acre is fully occupied with uh, garlic mustard instead. Or so, you know, you know, so there, you know, you, have, you win some, you lose some, but, uh, um, you know, hats off to you for, you know, making the attempt. Well, that's a good point. I mean, do you plant something else? Do you put seeds down? Or well, to... if people are actually pulling the bushes, then uh, I like to suggest people work in teams and because you are disturbing the soil. Right. And it would be great if you could replace it with something else native, either, you know, a, a sprig of a high bush blueberry, for example, or one of the dogwood shrubs or something, the viburnums, that sort of thing. Um, um, the two-step, this two-step control method that we recommend is a is a mechanical treatment where you cut it off, mm -hmm. and then you go back after it re-sprouts and either flame it or put just a little squirt of herbicide on the on the on the re-sprout, and that'll kill the plant without actually disturbing the soil. Mm -hmm. So your native and your natives will have an opportunity to to be competitively advantaged at that point. Mm -hmm. So so you might be able to. We use one of those uh, heavy-duty weed whacker type of brush cutters with the, with, with the three-bladed metal blade on it. It works really well for doing that initial mechanical treatment. Mm -hmm. Once again, in teams, um, somebody to cut, somebody to pull this stuff away with the cutoff part away with an iron rake or something so you can see that you've gotten everything that you're supposed to cut. You know, that works pretty well. And then uh, if we bring out the, um, uh, the flame torch, uh, the backpack torch, why well, I get all kinds of volunteers who want to do that. Um, you know, they say to the students, who wants to use the flamethrower today? You know, and, you know, they're very excited about that. So that works pretty well. Do you still do control burns? Well, you know, there, there are control burns that get done in this state. I don't do them, but um, uh, there is a, one of the state foresters is quite expert at it, and um, 
they get their team together, they make a plan. If all the conditions are right, then yeah, they do them. But it's mostly on state land because it's hard to um, it's hard to pull something like that off on, on private land. So, but it is it is possible. So, you have to have a burn plan, and you have to have the cooperation of your local fire company. So, other questions? Yes. So you kind of addressed it, but you know, you, you mentioned uh, you know all of the nasty invasives that we always want to get rid of, and, and I certainly appreciate the idea that you know if you're looking for woodcocks or, or you know yellow belly you know zebra fish, then then figure out what they want <laughs> and, and make that habitat. But uh, if you could maybe touch on again on on some you know preferable species to plant that just generally have a good ecological value, you know here in this part of Connecticut. Um, most of your most of your commercial nurseries are sensitive to people who come and ask about native species and they'll have a, a selection for you. But think about the blueberries. Okay. There's three, there's a flowering dogwood tree that we're all familiar with, but there's three dogwood shrubs that are also native to um, Connecticut that are, that work well in areas that are um, uh, at least some sunlight and a little bit on the damp side. If you drive up, if you drive up Route Nine towards the Cromwell, um, the median is full of a of a dogwood shrub called silky dogwood. I mean, not, not silky dogwood, uh, gray stem dogwood that uh, produces the little white berries in the fall, and uh, um, that's a very valuable uh, habitat um, uh, component. Uh, there are several viburnums. Um, Maple leaf viburnum is very common in the woods in our area. It's a shade tolerant species. Uh, there's a, a, a more of a wetland species called uh, nanny berry, um, and then uh, several uh, sort of commercial varieties of the uh, the trilobum, the, the high bush cranberry type, uh, the witch hobble. Those are all viburnums, opposite leaves, and um, uh, elderberry in full sunlight in wet areas is a, is a great choice. Um, so, yeah, so there's a few to, to mention. And then, uh, you know, any native tree can can be grown to a point and cut and allowed to re-sprout again. The, the, the native hardwoods will re-sprout repeatedly over and over and over again. So, it's called coppicing. Yeah. Anything else? Well, the last slides I had were, you know, about a project I did, and I'll tell you very quickly, a project we did in Higginham uh, on property that was owned by the, uh, uh, the school district um, in uh, uh, Regional District 17. And um, the property was donated to the school district for educational purposes. And so on one corner of the property, they built Haddam Elementary School, and then they have 130 acres of woodland that nobody ever did anything with. You know? So I went to the, the school super and well, I had a conversation one day, just out of the blue, with the, uh, the local technical arts teacher. And he was talking about the cost of lumber. I says, you know, you got 130 acres of woods over there. You could cut oak trees and, you know, if you managed it sustainably, you could produce all the oak lumber your shop would ever need in perpetuity. You know? And uh, you know, bring in a portable sawmill and saw whatever sizes you need and put them up to dry for a year and then give it to the kids. And um, oh, really? <laughs> you know, well, and one thing led to another. The next thing I know, I'm talking to the school superintendent to see if we can actually do this project. So for educational purposes, and so we uh, we inventory to stand. Uh, we've got a very detailed table of trees by species and size and it was mostly oak trees that are about 80 years old and uh, different kinds of oak trees all different kinds and um, overly dense you walk in the woods you could see dead trees the stand was thinning itself at that point because you know a, a patch of ground can only grow so much wood and then choices get made you know you die you get to grow the wood you know and um, and so the idea was, can we salvage some of the value of the trees that would be lost anyway and do it in such a way to let better trees grow for another 20 years or 10 years or whatever the case may be. And so we marked out a thinning on two acres of land, which we did with student labor. We felled the trees, we 
pulled them into a pile, we milled the logs with the portable sawmill, we produced about a thousand board feet of lumber for them, and many, many stacks of firewood, which they sold at their winter auction, you know, and um, sent the lumber down to the shop. And two years later, I hear from John, I said, you know, the kids are making stuff out of that. Oh, yeah, you guys saw it, you know. So, um, but the presentation is all about looking at the tables of data, looking, you know, here's, Here's how we look at our inventory data. Here's how we identify what we want to keep. Here's how I identify what's going to get cut there. Here's my winners and losers, and um, and uh, you know, and how that analysis is done. So, how is it that I come up with this recommendation that instead of you know 210 trees per acre and 120 square feet of basal area, what I really want is 150 trees per acre and 80 square feet of basal area. How do I know that? Well, this is that's what the presentation is all about. But um, um, and how we come up with those recommendations and why that desired condition is better for growing trees, you know, so or the trees that we want to grow. But uh, um, on a piece of private land, that thousand board feet of logs would get and that cordwood would get sold, okay, and the landowner would put the money in the bank, in a sound investment somewhere, and let it grow for the next 20 years. And 20 years later, they would come back, and they would have the same amount of wood that they would have if they had never cut anything. Only that same amount of wood would be on better trees, higher quality. They would get a higher price for their wood if they decided to sell again. And this is where the economic magic comes in. So, anyway. Any other questions? I have a two-part question. Okay. Um, when a really big tree falls over in the woods, generally speaking, <coughs> is it better to just leave? Does it better for the woods to just leave it there or cut it up? And when you see a really magnificent tree down somewhere, is there somebody you can call and come and make good use of it? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, the the answer to the first question is, it depends on what the the uses are and satisfaction you're taking out of your woodland. Now, if a tree dies standing, gets all nicely dry and seasoned, and falls over, it's more than likely on my property that it's going to find its way to the wood stove. But if I had a a wetter area that was sensitive, I was concerned about salamander habitat and that sort of thing, it would stay right where it was. Because that large woody material, down woody material, that's great habitat feature. So it really all depends on what you want. Um, if a piece of wood, th there is a little cottage industry out there of people with portable milling equipment that uh, sometimes take an interest in really special pieces of wood. And they range from people who manufacture really high-end uh, finished furniture, you know, that's in the $2,000 to $5,000 range, you know, and and, um, and they'll come and take that, happily take that off your hands, And but very few people would ever pay you for it, you know. Um, and, um, a lot of the people who get free wood like that get so much of it, it's, if it's a hard to get to, they're, they're usually not equipped to do it. Um, in the context of other woods operations, a lot of times someone will, will pull it out for you, but uh, um, uh, even at Yukon, where we hear about, somebody tells us, oh, this great big tree fell across the trail. You know, we have a tractor and we have arches and we have the portable sawmill and all that stuff. But it's even, even that sometimes it's hard for us to just get to it, you know, and um, as much as we would love to. And then we saw, you know, it's all part of teaching, it's all part of learning, it's all part of experience, and I have a shed full of lumber waiting for somebody to do something with it, you know. So um, that's not an easy answer to your question, but that's the reality of it these, these days. So uh, once again, I encourage you to take a look at the materials in the back and also take a look at these maps over here on the side. We'll turn up the lights so you can see a little better. And uh, keep your eye out for Guilford TV.